All right. So again, thanks everyone for joining us today. I'm really delighted that we're able to have this presentation uh, for you today. Um, our speaker is Dr. Penny Reynolds, and she is an American Statistical Association certified research statistician uh, here in the Department of Anesthesiology at the College of Medicine at the University of Florida. Um, she earned her PhD at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and it involved field work and mathematical modeling of wildlife behavior. She currently has over 50 publications on topics like physiological ecology, comparative physiology, avian behavior, fluid recitation, shock and trauma, um, and coagulopathy. She's collaborated on several investigations of vasoplasia and coagulopathy in human cardiac surgery and pre-hospital medicine. But her recent research, um, and this is how I uh, ended up stumbling into Dr. Reynolds, she's focused on the methodological quality of preclinical research and how poor reporting quality jeopardizes the translational potential of that research. She is a member of the International Working Group for the Revision of ARRIVE, which is animal research reporting in vivo experiments. Um, and that the working group is based out of London. And we are so lucky to have one of the authors of this very important reporting guideline with us here today. So now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Reynolds. Please go ahead and start. Okay, thank you, Melissa, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining. I'll start with a brief introduction to the ARRIVE guidelines, uh, especially for people who are not familiar with them. I'll describe what they are, why we need them, and how they came about. But most of the talk will center on the 2020 revised version. I will highlight the major reorganization changes we've made and do a, a deeper dive into a description of the major reproducibility items. And finally, I'll identify some of the major barriers to implementation that have been observed over the past 10 years and reiterate just how compliance with best practice reporting, not just for preclinical research, but all research can improve your translational hit. And the very last slide will be posted the links where you can find ARRIVE 2.0. So first of all, a quick shout out to um, the National Center for the Replacement, Refinement, and Reduction of Animals in Research, and especially Dr. Nathalie percy Doucet, who's head of experimental design and the project leader for the ARRIVE 2.0 um, guideline revisions, to all the staff, the uh, working group participants, and a special tribute to Professor Doug Altman, who sadly died before we had completed the revisions but he has been the major driving force behind worldwide initiatives to improve reliability and reporting of all biomedical and health research. So the ARRIVE guidelines. So as indicated, it's an acronym for animal research reporting of in vivo experiments. Now there's a widespread misconception that Stating that you are in compliance with ARRIVE is somehow synonymous with compliance with ethical care and use standards. No, that's not correct. These are reporting guidelines and ARRIVE is a checklist. These guidelines represent established best scientific practice and they are determined by international consensus. And the guidelines identify the minimum information to be reported that allows independent assessment of the research study for reliability, validity, and reproducibility. Now, at the moment, they consist of a checklist. However, the 2020 uh, revisions will incorporate fairly extensive explanatory documentation, which I'll talk about a bit later. So the whole purpose of the ARRIVE guidelines is to improve the quality of animal-based research. Now, incomplete reporting of relevant and critical information makes many publications, not just preclinical research, but pretty much all biomedical research, a very limited value. And checklists have been demonstrated to improve outcomes for all sorts of endeavors. For example, airline pilots, surgery teams, of all levels of competence, all skill levels, all experience levels substantially improve outcomes because checklists assure that all essential and relevant tasks are completed before the plane takes off or before the surgery starts. So what checklists do and what arrive checklines arrived does is that improved reporting of animal-based research will make published information much more useful. It will minimize the number of poor quality, redundant, 
studies that are conducted. And therefore, by improving the quality, it will in better inform future research and have an improved platform for translation. So the whole premise is that there's a shift in reporting from an emphasis on sexy results to sound and rigorous methods. So a quick a diversion, what is reproducibility? There's a lot of confusion, a lot of um, conflicting definitions, but it's pretty much defined in terms of three major elements, methods, results, and inferences. Methods reproducibility, study procedures and analyses have to have enough information and detail provided so that they can be repeated. Results reproducibility or replicability is a strategic use of multiple approaches, independent studies to collect new data for the same basic research question. And this is referred to by Marcus Moonfall as triangulation. And then finally, inferential reproducibility explicitly chooses slightly different analytical approaches that depend on different assumptions but in analyzing the same data, they should still nevertheless come to the same or similar conclusions. Now, although all three slightly differ in approach, all three rely on the assumption that the underlying data are trustworthy. So what ARRIVE does is identify and combine all of these reproducibility standards for an individual study. Reproducibility requires a representative model. Model, models, animal models are a proxy for some clinical condition, and therefore it's going to be an exercise in both approximation and compromise. The point is, though, is that different species or different strains of animals will react differently, but they will, may capture certain aspects of the condition that others cannot. So they have to be described properly and completely. The second leg of this triangle is what was done. It has to be transparent, it has to be accurate, and it should be in accordance with best practice. And then finally, what was found, as long as the data are presented honestly, research consumers can assess the strengths, weaknesses, and proper interpretation. It may not always be reliable and valid or robust, but at least we can assess it independently. So the bottom line is that reproducibility rests on a foundation of sound methods and clear and transparent reporting. So back to ARRIVE, the scope of application is all areas of research involving animals. Typical lab species like rats and mice, most people understand, but it also applies to a variety of different studies where animals are used. The highly sentient, vertebrates, livestock, cephalopods, fish, reptiles, amphibians, and even model organisms, zebrafish, axolotls, drosophila, and even C. elegans. It can apply to combination studies where both live animals or animals for purpose are used with in vitro and bench top determinations. Animals that are killed just for cell and tissue harvest. And even where animals are not directly used, but databases and data repositories. The principles of transparent reporting are fundamental for all of these different types of study. So who should use them? Well, pretty much anybody who needs to accurately assess what was done, why it was done, what was found, and how valid and reliable the results are. First and foremost, it's important for investigators because not only does it enable them to more easily report completely, transparently, and accurately what their research methods were and what they found, it also enables them to identify best practices standards before the study even begins. It's also important for co-authors. Um, even if you don't do the experiments yourself, and you, but you collaborate in experiments, you should be able to trust but verify. You should be able to know what other people have done and if it's valid. And finally, for the vast majority of people who are research consumers, so that's not only other investigators, but it also includes funding agencies, journals, peer reviewers, and the public at large, especially if their money is being invested in our research, they have a right to know how their investment is being used. Now, early comments on uh, deficient research reporting go back centuries. Um, you find people as 
it, from the 1600s, like Sir Robert Boyle complaining about how poorly other people described their research. But in modern times, probably the first person to do so was Donald Mainland, and he pointed out that incomplete reporting is not just something that a few nitpicky people complain about because they have nothing better to do with their time. The whole point is, is that it's impossible for anybody else to determine what might be expected in the future, and it makes the data of little or no use. By the mid-2000s, there's enough concern expressed about deficiencies in preclinical research reporting that a survey was commissioned by the NC3Rs, which is a UK government-sponsored scientific organization. And with joint sponsorship with NIH OLAW from the United States, they conducted a systematic survey and review of published government-funded preclinical research. And the results were more dire than people had ever anticipated because they found major reporting deficiencies in all of these peer reviewed studies. And most of it concerned key information that would indicate the scientific value of the study. So as a result, um, NCPRs formed a working group encompassing multiple stakeholders and developed the first round of ARRIVE guidelines. So what these were were the recommendations taken from the working group consolidated into a single comprehensive evidence-based set of reporting items, and that became the ARRIVE checklist. Now, over the past decade, they've been endorsed by over a thousand journals, almost 30 professional scientific societies, many major funders from UK, Europe, the United States, including the United States Department of Defense and the NIH National Library of Medicine. There have been um, complementary guidelines from NIH, uh, first of all, for reporting preclinical research and for rigor and re reproducibility and grant applications. Although these guidelines are a little less comprehensive and focusing more on the internal validity of um, papers and also on journal policy for the reporting of methods, they nevertheless do encompass most of the reproducibility items that ARRIVE describes. However, they are recommending that ARRIVE is the community standards which should be followed. Now, unfortunately, there has been almost no movement of the needle in terms of the reporting quality of published research. Sloppy and incomplete reporting is still unfortunately the norm. Uh, 2014, um, Francis Collins and Larry Tabak of NIH said that re preclinical research more than anything, is most susceptible to reproducibility problems. It was also thought that the peer review process and editorial policies could do, do far to changing the um, status of reporting, but so far they've been really disappointing. Um, relying on peer review, granted, is essentially a downstream solution because the experiments have already been performed and the animals used, so waste, if any, has already occurred. But it was thought that education and having papers rejected would pro provide an opportunity for um, investigators to change. But it just didn't work. Um, So-called passive dissemination, like relying on endorsement of guidelines and editorials for education communication have had little or no effect. The Icarus trial was a randomized, blinded, controlled trial to to test the effects of having investigators complete checklists. And they found out that just that submission by investigators had no effect on the completeness of reporting. Peer review doesn't seem to work in itself, but one journal, Stroke, found that by mandating peer reviews to complete a key item reporting checklist did have a positive effect. Um, other journals put out by the same publisher who did not install these um, requirements, did not find any, any change in reporting. So because of these disappointing results, in 2017, NC3Rs convened a second international working group to revise the ARRIVE guidelines with the goal of improving implementation by making them more useful and more user-friendly. So this was a very extensive, uh, multiple iteration, extensive international collaboration with multiple and very extensive outreach networks. 
The International Working Group comprised 20 members from seven countries, multiple stakeholders with diverse expertise. Working units were two or three members of the working group assigned to each item. Uh, every individual probably was, um, had more than one item to go over, so there was a constant shuffling and, and um, collaboration between different people. Definitions were revised, refined. Um, they were brought into alignment with best possible evidence, which was compiled, fed back to the main group. Delphi methods were used to both prioritize items and achieve consensus. And finally, it was fed out to the scientific community at large, which consisted of first 50 stakeholders from 19 countries and another 11 participants were added for road testing and feedback, so the circle began again. So the ARRIVE 2.0 guidelines are the results of this intensive effort. So first of all, the highlights, the major revisions are three. They consist of a two-tiered classification checklist rather than the just one 20 item checklist we had before, an ex explanation and elaboration document, and an expanded statistics documentation section. So I'm going to go through this in more detail in a bit, but the two tiers consist of the first 10 items which are essential for reproducibility. These are the minimum key items to be reported. And the second 11 set are recommended to provide further context for a particular study. The explanation and elaboration document is modeled after, after a similar document for consort. What it is is a user's manual, and it's to act as a companion to ARRIVE 2.0. So it provides elaboration of each of the items, provides a detailed description of what they are, um, reasons why they are included, the details that need to be reported, and it gives two or more examples of good reporting for each item. Due to popular request, we have greatly expanded the statistics documentation. Now, it was pretty hard not to go down the rabbit hole of writing an entire new textbook on statistics. So this is not in any means a statistics how-to manual. The emphasis is on frequently misunderstood and misapplied items. We have provided a glossary of commonly misunderstood terms. And we've also provided expanded descriptions of basic statistical design concepts, the experimental unit, how statistical control variability is accomplished, an introduction to some basic formal study designs and randomization methods. So the question that gets asked fairly frequently is why is there so much emphasis on statistics? Well, this is the first major misconception that has to be corrected is that statistics is not a thing, it's a process. And analyses actually start before data are collected pre-study. Um, there's been a series of investigations to show that poor design and faulty statistical analysis are factors in over 50% of irreproducible clinical research. So it's absolutely essential that good statistical principles must be built in very early in the design, up here, not down here. Upstream problems cannot be fixed downstream. So now we will do the deep dive into the essential 10 reproducibility items. Spoiler alert, none of these things are brand new. None of these things we have dreamed up on our own. Most of these have been in place for almost a century and certainly for more than 50 years. So the first five are study design, sample size, animal inclusion exclusion criteria, randomization, and blinding. A study design is the formal arrangement and structuring of your independent input predictor variables that are hypothesized to affect the response of interest. So these, the response is what relates to your tests of predictions resulting from your hypotheses. Now formal designs have been available for well over a century. Um, they're superior because they can detect interactions, synergisms, they have much more power to detect real treatment differences and require far fewer resources for the amount of information obtained than most of the conventional so-called designs that you see out there. 
And this is because introductory statistics service courses rarely teach design. So study design it, to most investigators is often conflated with one-way analysis of variance. So this confusion means that it's not uncommon to see studies with multiple separate experiments, multiple separate treatment arms, which are ultimately wasteful and inefficient. Sample size is important because it, we need to establish that there is minimal harm for maximum scientific value. I think everyone understands that having too many animals in excess of what the experiment requires is wasteful because it wastes those excess animals. However, what is less understood that underpowered studies waste all of the animals in a non-informative experiment. Now, what sample size is actually referring to is what's called the experimental unit, the physical entity which can be assigned at random to a treatment, such that any two experimental units must be capable of receiving different treatments. It's usually a single animal, but suppose you have a cage or a tank of fish or one pregnant female which is given the experimental intervention. Well, then the cage or the tank or the female is the experimental unit, not the individual animals or the pups in the litter. So misidentification of the EU is fairly common and results in artificial inflation of the sample size. Sample size must also be justified statistically if one is testing hypothesis, one commonly uses a power calculation, but it also needs to be justified operationally and in accordance with the three R's of replacement, refinement, reduction. Operational means that the numbers of animals have to be feasible given the time, resources, and personnel available to do the project. Animal inclusion criteria. This is sort of an a priori description and criteria for determining an outliers. It allows assessment of study validity and minimizes any bias that would result from arbitrary decisions. And it also reduces the temptation to cherry pick data or results. For example, I was once in witnessing a, an experiment where the investigator said, oh, this animal's not doing well let's make it a control. So you can see how bias could be very easily introduced by not having appropriate inclusion exclusion criteria done beforehand. Randomization. This is another major statistical concept that is frequently confused. It's often conflated with the colloquial meaning of random, meaning haphazard or ad hoc. It isn't. Randomization to a statistician has a formal and very precise and very technical meaning. It means that each intervention should have an equal probability of being assigned to each experimental unit. Random sequence allocation refers to the order in which treatments are allocated to the experimental units in the order in which they're processed. Now, for randomization purposes, computer software programs are the best because they leave an audit trail and they should be used to generate the random sequence because by and large, they're not subject to bias. Why do we randomize? Well, not only to remove any systematic bias from the treatment assignments that may come about because of, <coughs> excuse me, conscious or unconscious bias on the part of the investigator, but what a lot of people don't realize is that statistical hypothesis tests have randomization as their very foundation. So if your experiments are not properly randomized, your inferential tests and the results from them are invalid. It's not that they're wrong, they're invalid. So highly misleading. And finally, blinding is the logistical method to conceal treatment assignments. This is to minimize uh, bias, either conscious or unconscious, on the part of the investigator in allocating um, treatments to subjects, picking subjects for different con groups, control or experimental, in assessing the outcome and interpreting the results. The next of the top 10 are outcome measures, statistical methods, experimental animals, experimental procedures, and results reporting. Outcome measures are specific measurable variables that are used to assess the effects of the experimental intervention and used to test the hypothesis. 
So by specific and measurable, you can't just say you're testing immune function because that has no meaning. You have to define what it is in terms of something that can be measured. The primary outcome is the variable that the investigator considers to be the most important amongst all the many other outcomes that are to be measured in the study. It needs to be defined at the time the study is designed for two reasons. First of all, it reduces the risk of false positive errors that result from the statistical testing of many outcomes indiscriminately. And two, it reduces the risk of false negative error by allowing appropriate and adequate power estimation of the sample size. You power your experiment off the primary outcome. Statistical methods can incorporate anything from the most basic of the summary descriptive statistics to very complex models. Now, statistical reporting guidelines have been around since at least the 1980s. And valid statistical methods are absolutely essential components of a high quality scientific report. However, because best practice statistical methods, just like everything else, are continually evolving, descriptions must be consistent and they must be complete. You should never boilerplate the descriptions of your methods. And because the statistical analyses are so closely related to the specific study design and how you collected your data, they must align with that specific study and the specific central hypotheses. We've also found that most uh, errors that are made um, at, in the stage in statistical analyses are in very basic methods. And most of these error, errors are serious enough to really question the validity of the results. Animal characteristics are important for understanding how interventions might impact the experimental units. Uh, we know that strain, substrain effects, age, sex example are important determinants of how the animals actually respond. So these need to be reported completely and in detail. And that goes for animals that are killed for purpose, not just ones whose physiological responses are of direct interest. Experimental procedures. Now, most investigators understand the necessity of complete and transparent reporting of all the procedures that relate directly to the experiment, and those are usually pretty good. However, the tendency is to forget that all manipulations, whether or not directly related to the experiment itself, can still affect the experimental outcome. So that includes the surgery procedures, drugs, analgesia, anesthesia, welfare assessment, humane endpoints, euthanasia. So you must report those items to allow other people to assess the factors that contribute to variation in the response and how generalizable usage findings are. Finally, result, results reporting. Um, the reporting principle here is that enough detail should be provided so that results can be incorporated in other analyses. At the very least, you need to report the sample size per group, the appropriate descriptive statistics for each group, whether mean, median, whatever. And then when reporting differences between groups, we need an effect size with a confidence interval. We do not include p-values as reproducibility criteria, which will be a shock to many people, I know. But p-values do not confer reproducibility. A p-value alone cannot tell you if your study results are important or generalizable or even real, because the strength of all the conclusions are derived from how relevant the model is, the study design, how good it is, how well bias has been controlled, how well your data has been collected, and how standardized and what good quality control procedures are in place. Small p-values, or p-values in general, are random variables. They are dependent on the data, and they can occur with poor or no study design, inappropriate sample sizes, large sampling variation, mistakes in the methods, incorrect or poor analyses, bias, and so on. So just because you have a small p-value doesn't necessarily mean your results are real. So when we say effect size, an effect size is a quantitative measure of the difference between groups, so the strength of relationship between variables. So it's quite simple. Define a priori what difference you would, you would need to detect to determine if your experiment works or if the experimental intervention really does have an effect over any control. Next step is to es estimate the effect size, the 95% confidence intervals with your data, and then interpret that in the context of 
your a priori definition. And again, this is not new. This has been emphasized for decades, going on to well over half a century in many fields of biomedical research. So I provided a quick example just to illustrate this because it's a concept that's not very familiar to many people. This is something I got, I got out of a paper. Uh, they were studying systolic blood pressure reduction of, of a, this certain drug versus the placebo control in 160 patients. And this is what they concluded in their abstract. Drug A significantly reduced systolic blood pressure, P less than 0.001. Oh, great, you would conclude that the drug is very successful. But this is not informative. In this very same paper, the investigators predefined a clinically important reduction in systolic blood pressure would be more 10 millimeters of mercury or more. Their own data showed that the mean reduction was only five millimeters with a confidence interval of between seven and two millimeters reduction. So yes, it was statistically significant, but it wasn't clinically important and the drug did not in fact work. So in this particular case, statistical significance is just an artifact of the precision with which the data were measured. The drug did not, in fact, work. So I provided these links for essential reading <coughs> for you to look at later. I'm not going to go over them in any detail. The first one is the American Statistical Association Statement on P-Values. The paper by Sandra Greenland and colleague talks about all the common conceptions and misinterpretations of p-values. And finally, the Lang and Altman paper has basic statistical reporting guidelines. Now the second 11 set or the recommended set are those items which need to be reported to provide narrative detail and context to a particular study report. It should be emphasized that these are not necessarily optional, even though they're recommended. They may be essential for other investigators who are interested in replicating this particular study because they are important in assessing both the internal and external validity of the study and also the quality of the welfare and ethical oversight. Now I'm going to emphasize the ones I've outlined in yellow here, why the study was done, welfare validity um, measures, and open science practices. First of all, study background. This are all the reasons why the study was performed. So you have to do a fairly um, systematic and thorough literature search, both to place your study in the context of other studies and to show what the research gap is that's being addressed. This is the study relevance and study significance that's requested for in grant applications, for example. Um, it also outlines specifics such as the central hypothesis, objectives, and the specific aims, or what it has been measured in order to test the central hypothesis. Who wants this? Well, everybody who counts. Ethical oversight committees, IACOC and AWERB in, in the UK, funding and agencies, journals. Who do you need to call? You need to talk to the people who really know how to handle information, and that's research librarians. It's a grossly underutilized group of domain experts. Research librarians are the people who know how to obtain information, curate it, and extract it. So these are the people you really need to call. The second as aspect, housing, husbandry, care, and monitoring is probably the most frequently underreported item in animal-based studies. And this is unfortunate because especially for rodents and um, ectotherms, environmental factors account for the vast majority of, of experiments that cannot be reproduced. Rodents in particular are particularly sensitive to minor changes in all environmental factors, food, bedding, temperature, light exposure, and handling procedures can be especially stressful. For example, picking them up by their tail, they never have been sure to that. And this is why best practices have evolved to the point where now tunnel handling is now going to be the standard of care rather than just poking them up by the tail. Vendor and substrain, there is a rather terrifying example given in lab animal and in cell reports a couple of years ago where sudden random or cumulative gen genetic drift can occur in all mouse strains, thus affect experiments in unexpected ways. And the Cell Reports article 
describes how investigators were held up for more than two years trying to chase down what it was that made their research results invalid. Open science practices are now being encouraged by more and more journals. Um, it should be emphasized that poor research, of course, is the fault of authors, not journals, but journals can certainly do more to require more transparency and mandate more scrutiny. And this is what open science practices do. Protocol registration is now standard for human trials, and it is a major tool for ensuring unbiased reporting of trial methods and results. It should be easy in principle for preclinical research because protocols need to be filed with ethical oversight committees, but there has been a fair amount of pushback. Um, discussions with colleagues in the UK and Australia indicates that most protocols seem to be constructed on what investigators wish to accomplish rather than being a practical blueprint of what can actually be accomplished. So that makes protocols very difficult to um, submit before results are actually collected. Now, open data access are especially enable greater transparency and support public oversight. The uh, recent fiasco with the New England Journal of Medicine and Lancet retractions really emphasizes this. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, the Lancet and New England Journal had to retract articles on COVID-19 hydro hydroxychloroquine because the data integrity and provenance could not be specified. It turned out that the co-authors hadn't seen the data themselves, and then they were very quick to scramble to the opposite shore when everything seemed to be going south. Given the seriousness of that topic and the consequences of that, those papers, it, they really are one of the biggest attractions in modern history because studies like this determine how people live or die tomorrow. So data access is certainly not only informs the larger community, but it certainly can get, go far to re uh, reduce fraud and misrepresentation. So some of the barriers. So you recall that incomplete reporting is still the norm. Um, this has been going on for years and years and years. There seems to be four basic categories of investigators as to why incomplete reporting seems to be the thing. They cannot report, they don't report, they don't know what to report, or they don't want to. You can't report what hasn't been formed, uh, it hasn't been performed. And a big part of this problem, which is not investigators' fault, but it's ignorance of basic experimental design and statistical thinking. Now, the blame here lies solely in the realm of introductory statistics service courses, because they're just not teaching these fundamental concepts. So as a result, investigators have very poor skills. They don't understand technical terms and methods. And computational software is so easy to use that anyone can use it without understanding what the um, assumptions and principles are that underline it. Uh, secondly, investigators do not report. These are two subgroups here. There's one, major one group thinks that specific research items are not relevant to their research. Uh, for example, demographics, housing, husbandry. This is most common in studies which are reporting data for animals killed for purpose. In these cases, they don't really see the animals as animals, they just see them as petri plates. And so therefore it's hard for them to understand why those specific items are relevant. They are. Then there's another group which just, they recognize that they have not performed key reproducibility items. So they just skip over that in the writing and hope nobody will notice. And because peer review is so inconsistent, then they're usually justified in that gamble. They've been allowed to get away with it. In order to honestly report the data, you should not skip over this, but address these omissions as a limitation of the research. Investigators do not know what to report. I've heard journal editors moaning about this quite a bit, is that many investigators don't read instructions to authors or the editorials, so they don't keep up with changes in best practice. So they honestly don't know what to report because they're not educating themselves. And then finally, investigators don't want to report it. Um, Usually the thinking here is that all guidelines, not just arrive, but 
all reporting guidelines and ethical welfare compliance guidelines represent some sort of monstrous bureaucratic overreach. Um, the line goes, I've been doing this for 30 years and I've never been asked to do this before and changing my practice will mess up all my results. This is really silly because guidelines are a tool to facilitate best practice and best reporting. They're not a substitute for creative thinking. And it really doesn't reflect too well on the researcher who refuses to keep up with evolving best practice. Um, it's also ironic because in fact, investigators rarely refuse to adopt new technologies that could cause a reevaluation of your older data. So why they wouldn't want to keep up with other areas of evolving best practice is somewhat of a mystery. Well, unfortunately, embedded culture is very hard to change. There's the attitude that everybody does it this way. Blog practices are extremely deeply entrenched in the literature and investigators copy and perpetuate bad practice and bad reporting because that's what they see. Then there's the perverse inf incentives of the system is that career advancement and the advancement of science principles are diametrically opposed. And so, it's very easy to do questionable practices that will get you that P is less than 0.05. I'm not saying that everybody does or even that they mean to. It's just there and it's been recognized as a major um, obstacle to improving scientific reporting. And then there's a problem which was identified back in 1605 by Sir Francis Bacon. He called this the contract of error between researchers and research consumers. And that is the, the conjoined twins of amazing and interesting and exaggerated claims without substantive evidence are presented on the one hand. And then on the other hand, there is uncritical acceptance of claims at face value without the research consumer doing their due diligence. So why does all this matter? Well, because poor quality research is wasted research and wasted research is of both a financial and an ethical liability. There is a scathing series of articles by Ian Chalmers and 40 other authors in The Lancet about six years ago. And they estimated the direct costs to research are anywhere between 50 to 85% of the total research effort, which is avoidable. And the costs in the US alone are equivalent to approximately the working budget of NIH for a year. Global costs may exceed $200 billion. That's real money. But there's also the collateral costs that thousands of humans are injured and killed every year because amazing, promising um, treatment modalities, which look so good in preclinical trials, just don't make it through the um, phase two, three, four clinical trial pipeline. And also because research has been diverted off into less productive channels. But then there's also the hundreds of millions, if not billions of animals that are wasted in less than informative experiments. So these are both ethical and financial problems. So how can arrive to O benefit us? Well, it can improve the translational hit by building quality early into your research study. So during your planning and during protocol development, what the guidelines do was point out the, those specific items and methods to build in reliability, valid, validity, and reproducibility to be built right into your study. Now this means it's not going to be business as usual for a number of investigators. It might mean you'll have to learn new skills, especially design of experiments, better methods of analysis. It may mean incorporating domain experts into your study teams, like a properly qualified applied statistician, like a research librarian. It will mean better record keeping, pre-surgical, surgical records, lab notebooks, and implementation of specific QA and QI procedures, which it should be noted the NIH is already requesting. However, the advantages are that a properly planned, well-designed, and well-reported study is actually a force multiplier. Trial and error studies, or doing it the way we've always done it, just waste resources, take a long time without any guarantee of success, and can give ambiguous results. But with a properly designed experiment, 
rapid convergence on a solution, there's clear results, and it can dramatically reduce both the amount of testing and the resources that are required. During the manuscript writing, the checklist of these reproducibility items to be reported are a very powerful tool for you to prioritize and organize massive amounts of very complex information. So that makes papers easier to write. It also makes them much easier to review. Now, it should be added at this point that investigators are never compelled to perform every item on the list, but the reporting should be complete. If you don't perform a key reproducibility items, you need to say so. They need to be, the, the omission needs to be justified if there is a scientific justification for it and listed as a limitation. And then after publication, high quality data that are reliable and valid and reproducible have a much longer shelf life. So our goal should be not just to get the publication out, but ensure that it lives beyond the lifespan of the immediate attention. Because high quality, well-reported data can contribute to databases, they contribute to systematic reviews, and therefore reliably inform future research. So finally, in conclusion, where to find the ARRIVE 2.0 guidelines? They're scheduled for launch on July the 7th, so that's just a few weeks from now. They're going to be coming out in PLOS Biology. There'll be a simultaneous release in five other journals. Um, I'm not at liberty at the moment to tell you what they are. One's a veterinary journal, there'll be two physiology journals, and a basic science journal. And the ARRIVE website will go live on July 7th at www.arriveguidelines.org. So thank you very much for attending. And back to Melissa. Okay, thank you so much for this incredibly informative um, and valuable talk. I know I learned a lot and I really appreciate your time in talking with us today about these guidelines that are going to be coming out. Um, we actually have not gotten any questions in the chat, so if there are any questions, I would encourage you to enter them in right now so that we can grab Dr. Reynolds for a few more minutes. No worries. Okay, well, um, I'm not seeing anyone um, who has a question. So I guess that means that we are concluded here today. Again, I just want to thank you, Dr. Reynolds, for this really informative talk. And um, I, I would hope and encourage all of you um, to use the ARRIVE 2.0 guidelines when they're revealed. And um, also thank you for promoting the role of medical librarians in the research process. We really appreciate that as well. So thank you so much to everyone who attended. And thank you, uh, especially to Dr. Reynolds for this wonderful talk. <laughs>